The Saluki is one of the oldest pure breeds of domesticated dog. For thousands of years, it has inhabited a vast landscape which extends throughout the Arab and most of the Muslim worlds. No other breed in its original habitat has adapted to such a wide range of cultures, climates, and conditions, from the snow-capped peaks of the Karakoram to the searing sands of Arabia. Among the Arabs, the smooth-coated Saluki has been identified with a large inland region of Saudi Arabia called the Najd. It includes the capital city, Riyadh. Traditionally, the smooth-coated Salukis were known as Najdi, meaning from the Najd. The feathered variety were known as Shami a name which indicates someone from Damascus, the capital of Syria. Salukis have appeared in the art and artifacts of ancient civilizations from Morocco to western China, a distance that spans more than 6,000 miles. Generally, the feathered chami predominated in mountainous regions and in countries with colder climates, such as Syria, Turkey, Iraq, Iran, and Afghanistan. The smooth Nejdi were more predominant in the desert areas, from the Atlantic Ocean to the Arabian Gulf. Perhaps their greatest concentration has been among the Bedouin tribes of Arabia. Some reports extend the Saluki's range even further, south across the equator to the Kalahari Desert, home to the African Bushman. Here, skilled hunters stalk their prey just as their ancestors did thousands of years ago. This photograph, published in 1961, shows what appear to be Salukis helping to bring down a Gemsbach. Which came first, feathered or smooth? Let's begin with the archaeological evidence. The oldest known representation of a sighthound is a painting on stone in the Sahara region of southern Algeria. It dates between 8,000 and 7,000 BC. The dog is a prick-eared African sighthound, also known as a tessum. This painting from the 6th millennium BC shows several African sighthounds chasing game and assisting in the kill. The prick-eared African sighthound, shown here in more detail, is the ancestor of the modern pharaoh hound. In the period between 5 and 4,000 BC, a smooth-coated sighthound with hanging or lop ears made its first appearance in ancient art. Known as the Asian sighthound, this dog is the ancestor of the smooth Saluki. The oldest known depiction of Salukis are on these cylinder seals made of clay dating from the 4th millennium BC. They were found in the mid-1930s in the ancient town of Tepigara, Iraq, on an expedition led by an American scientist, Dr. Charles Beche. Used as signature stamps on correspondence, the seals show various scenes of smooth-coated Salukis. They were created some 2,000 years prior to any known depiction of feathered Salukis. Genetics also favor the smooth. The smooth gene is a simple dominant and undoubtedly came first. The feather gene, which is recessive, could have resulted from spontaneous mutation or an early outcross to some other type of hound. Or perhaps it was a result of selective breeding around 2200 BC. 
As demonstrated in this painting by Hans Holbein in 1521, smooth Salukis have been imported to Western Europe for centuries. This may have begun with the First Crusade in 1096 AD. More likely, it came even earlier with the spread of Islam across the trading routes of the Middle East and North Africa. England, 1923. Some 6,000 years after it began, the breed was registered for the first time in a national kennel club. During the period following the First World War, several popular feathered imports had been brought into England by British military officers. Feathered chamois have been the predominant variety in the West ever since. The French, however, seemed to prefer smooth-coated hounds. These smooth Salukis were owned by Xavier Prezhedsky, commandant of the French cavalry in Aleppo, Syria in the early 1930s. Prezhedsky spent his entire career in the Middle East and North Africa, and is the author of several influential books on sighthounds. His photographs provide a good look at smooths as they appeared in Syria some 65 years ago. On some of Prezhedsky's dogs, the ears were cropped according to local custom. The standard of points for the Saluki breed was adopted by the Saluki Club in England in 1923. It continues as the American Kennel Club standard today. This standard was written basically to describe the feathered Saluki. After some debate, the smooth was included as a separate variety in the final paragraph. The degree of feathering permitted in the standard differed in several important aspects from the original description of the feathered chami published in England in 1907. This description was written by the Honorable Florence Amherst, who imported dogs from the Middle East and established the first breeding program in England in 1895. She later became the first president of the Saluki Club. In 1907, she described the Shami's feathered coat as short, smooth, dense, very silky and soft to the touch. She added that there was no feathering at all under the body and only slight feathering around the tail and the back of the thighs. The 1923 standard omitted the word short and dense. It did not limit the amount of feather at the back of the thighs and it permitted slight woolly feather on thighs and shoulders. As for feet, Amher stated that the feet of Shamis are webbed and with slight feathers between the toes. The 1923 standard states well feathered between the toes. Amherst's description of hindquarters included the statement that the legs should not be too much feathered. They must be ornamented, never shaggy. These limitations on the amount of feathering were omitted completely in the 1923 standard. In the years between 1907 and 1923, more feathering obviously had become acceptable. The principal reason was Sarona Kelb, a Shami born in Damascus in 1919. He was imported by Major General Frederick Lance, who had served in Palestine and was a member of the British Kennel Club. Lance was instrumental in getting the breed accepted by the Kennel Club in 1923. In 1925, Sarona Kelb became the first male Saluki champion. His confirmation differed in two important ways from Amherst's 1907 description. He was larger, which resulted in the standard being written to cover a range of 23 to 28 inches in height, and he had more feathering, particularly on the feet, hindquarters, and throat. The 1923 standard, aided by the fact that Kelb was used extensively at stud, changed the look of chamois as they were originally described by Florence Amherst. By the 1960s, feathering was in full flower. Feathering on the neck, the forelegs, the feet, and the hindquarters became much more pronounced. Today, we see a distinct difference in look between the heavily feathered American Saluki and a Nejdi bred in Arabia. 
To the casual observer, they look like different breeds. Among many fanciers, the emphasis on more feathering has brought about an ongoing debate over form versus function. How important is hair? To the Bedouin, it's not an issue. Their interest lies more in function, the Sluki's ability to chase, catch, and kill game. As for long ear feathers, the Arabs were known to crop the ears of both the smooth and the feathered varieties. This was probably done for practical reasons. On cold winter nights, the ear tips are prone to frostbite, and encounters with wild dogs or jackals can result in the Saluki's ears being ripped. The Nejdi were bred to hunt gazelle and the desert hare, both of which are extremely fast and agile. This hunt for desert hare is taking place in a desolate region of Saudi Arabia known as the Empty Quarter. The hare runs at a furious pace, combining sudden changes in direction with sustained bursts of speed in excess of 30 miles per hour. The hunt may cover a distance of two to three miles before the hare either escapes or is caught. It is reported that the value of a Saluki is judged on the quality of its speed and agility, starting with the fifth hunt of the day. These smooth-coated Nejdi are capable of running more than 15 miles per day, up and down across the dunes with little opportunity for rest in between. Their ability to function is put to the ultimate test. In the western show ring, it is a different story. Here, form and feathering have taken precedence. The proof is in the record books. Orchard Shaheen, the feathered daughter of Sarona Kelb, became the first English Saluki champion in 1924. Thirty-nine years passed before Kamazi Kamandan, in 1963, became the first smooth to achieve an English championship. Despite their absence from the ring, smooths were used in breeding programs from the very beginning. For example, Sarona Kelb, whose bloodlines extend so far and wide among modern Salukis, was himself the product of mating smooth to feathered. His sire was a feathered dog named Slugi, and his dam was a smooth grizzled bitch named Baalbek. Breeding smooths to feathers continued a long Arab tradition. In the United States, the history of the smooth-coated Saluki began in 1937 when a young bitch, Tepigara Ayesha, was imported by Dr. Charles Baish, who discovered the famous cylinder seals. Baish obtained Ayesha while engaged in archaeological work at the ancient town of Tepigara in Iraq. Ayesha made her debut at the Morrison Essex Show in New Jersey in 1937. She later accompanied Baish to Syria and never returned to the United States. In 1945, the second smooth Saluki was imported into America. This was champion Lady Yelid Sarona Romola, originally bred by King Ibn Saud of Saudi Arabia. She and her crop-eared feathered mate, champion Abdul Farouk, were a gift to British Field Marshal Sir Henry Maitland Wilson, who later sold them to Esther Knapp of Pine Paddock Kennels. Mrs. Knapp incorporated both the Salukis into her breeding program. In 1947, their son, Rasim Ramullah, became the world's first smooth Saluki champion. Today, in the United States, there are three important smooth lines, the Monab Pavlusha, the Zanandi, and the Siddiqui Danish. Almost 98% of the smooths in America today are derived from these three lines. All three started from smooths which were born to two feathered parents. Genetically, the smooth coat is dominant, and occasionally it will sport and reassert itself in a puppy, even though both the parents are feathered. In America, the first occurrence was in 1968, when Monab Pavlusha was born. He was later bred to Lamak Pearl of Amalfi, and all of the Monab smooth line derives from that breeding. At Far Out Kennels in Frederick, Maryland, 
Alice Donaldson is a breeder well known for her feathered Salukis. Recently, however, she bred into the Monab Smooth line. This is a three-year-old feathered Saluki bitch who is Laverne. And we're going to show you some of her puppies coming up. She was bred to a smooth dog, Sierra. And we did this breeding for many reasons. Uh, one of them was that I wanted to get more muscle and more definition of muscle and go back to basics. Uh, she's from a litter of uh, five or six champions. And they're really more of the great American show dog type, uh, getting too long in body from point of shoulder to point of hip, this to this, to the ground, to the withers, you know, I feel is too long. Uh, it presents a pretty profile in the ring. It's a very appealing head, very pretty, but very show doggy. And I wanted to get more back to basics, showing muscle type. Let's bring buckwheat up here. This is her smooth son, who's a yearling. And uh, he definitely is showing the smooth characteristics, carrying a lot of muscle. Uh, there are things I like about him, there are things I don't like about him. But all in all, for an outcross breeding, I think we accomplished what we wanted to in defining muscle. Uh, dog is moderate, carrying a lot of neck, he's carrying a fine blade of bone. Good boy. Good boy. Uh, one of the things about this dog that I think is real important in a running hound, he has a, a, a nice under jaw, but he's got a great set of teeth. He has a very, very tight scissor spike, big teeth, sound. The dentation is just, just perfect. Some other examples of the Monab line were photographed in 1994 at the Saluki Club of America National Specialty. Mona Bataev and Paul imported Tahawi Halima and Tahawi Farouk from England, and when they bred them, they got a litter of eight puppies. Seven were feathered, one was smooth. That was Mona Pavlusha. Um, I like their I like their temperament. I think there's some things about smooths that are a little different from feathers, and I'm not entirely sure why. I've talked to some other people, and they seem to be more inclined to cuddle with people and we were conjecturing that perhaps this was because they're cold we don't know they uh, they have wrinkles when they're puppies they wrinkle here and they wrinkle there and they wrinkle here and and then they're different looking when they're babies than the feathered ones and uh, I don't know I, I think I was just trying to keep going with what I had in the feathered and hope I'd get smooths that were nice and then try to get some of the head type out of the smooths onto my feathers. I think that the smooth individual that I'm dealing with all the way down from Mona, they had really nice fronts. I certainly didn't, I've been in Salukis a long time before I even thought about owning one. Some of my best friends had them and I couldn't be bothered to have one. And uh, I think they grow on you. I think I have a third smooth in my house now. I have 12 dogs. I have four smooths and eight feathers. And I think they're great. I like looking at the, uh, the difference. I like the chiseling. I like the, um, the fact that there's no feathers, the fact that, that nothing's hidden. The second line of smooths in America began with the imported Nordic champion, Azadi Zanandi, bred by Birgitta Runemacher and Elizabeth Anderson. She came to the Srinagar Kennels in California in 1967. At Kenmar Knoll Kennels in California, 
Mary Ellen Gorski is a prominent breeder of the Zanandi line of smooths. All our work, in, for the people that did our standard, all the work of our parent club to not change that standard so that we can maintain a large gene pool is so important. And what's happening today is we're getting closer and closer to breeding only one kind of looking dog. Um, I think it's very bad for us. I think it is going to bring us not only uh, physical problems, it's going to bring us some real genetic problems because we're going to shrink that, we're going to breed for one kind, one look, and we're looking for trouble. What do you feel are the fine points of the breed? Uh, the fine points, if I were going to say, you have to be able to tell it's a Saluki what makes it this. When you look at it, and if you could take the head off, and it could become another dog, a sporting dog, or another sight hound, this is wrong. What are the points that make that? Top line, underline. None of the other sight hounds have the same top line that the Saluki has. None of the others have the same head that the Saluki has. The ear set being high is definitely contributing to that. The other thing are the feet, and I think the feet are very distinctive of our breed. When did you originally get smooths and why? Um, well, we saw our first smooth, who was Anandi. She was so unique. She was just an exquisite, refined lady. Uh, we never thought much more about it until in early 1974, in February, we were out at the Indio Day Festival, and this absolutely gorgeous little porcelain thing walked past us, apricot, slick from head to toe with the most gorgeous lines, and we were just mesmerized by her. Went home and said, that's beautiful. <laughs> Smooth or not? That's beautiful, but the fact that she was smooth just gave her, and of course you have to remember we had greyhounds first. So uh, the fact that it didn't have any hair was not an opposing thought to us. Uh, but so we tried to buy her. It took her, it took us a number of months, but we finally convinced uh, Winifred to sell her to us. She was a Rama daughter out of Zanandi. Absolutely not. They should never be judged separately. Oh, the pity if we ever take them away. You know, it's real easy to say, oh, let's separate them and we can get, you know, more majors just by smooths. But when you, which, if you breed smooths, you know in your heart that the smooths have their problems. And if you are not going to compete against the feathers, you are not going to have to produce smooths that are as good as the feathers. So you take them out of there, and you're not going to, you're going to lose your quality. At least I believe so. Do smooths have different temperaments? Oh, yes. <laughs> smooths' temperaments are smooth. No, smooths have a wonderful temperament. They are our love dogs, aren't they? They are for the people who want a Saluki, but they really would rather have them sit with them instead of on the other sofa. Uh, we had more people who just wanted pets come in and want our smooths because our smooths were friendly, they were outgoing, they were almost real dogs. Uh, yes, they are different. <laughs> Once in a while, you'll get one that's a bit aloof. Our Kusa was. But the sister, Kermitsi, was charming. Did you show your smooths? Absolutely. We showed the smooths. Uh, we were very proud of our smooths. We, champ we, let's see, we championed three from the Q litter. Uh, Nahati championed. Um, Zamira championed. Zorba championed. And from uh, our S litter, which was so. Kishra to Zorba, one of Zorba's daughters, 
uh, Sahula went over to Sweden and she championed over there and in fact she was bred over there and one of her daughters I uh, I believe is champion too. Who are your all-time favorite smooths? All-time favorite smooths? Well I think I would have to put Kusa. I know kennel blind perhaps a little but Kusa was one of those dogs that Honestly, people watched her in the ring, and uh, until they came out and went up to her, they did not know she was smooth. This was not the important thing, that she was smooth. She really, she had all the qualities of a Saluki. She fit the standard so well, and she looked like a feather, but she was smooth. But also with that, I did have the pleasure of seeing Af King Baghdad's Katolna's Khalif. And this was a lovely dog. He had, again, he could have been feathered. He was very pretty. Please, if you're new, turn around and face the camera, honey. This is um, the only smooth that we have right now. And his name is Firnu. And his mother was smooth, uh, our Kermitsi. And his father is Saracen Nasir Banaru. At the Kizilkun Kennels in Santa Cruz, California, Brian and Wendy Duggan breed both smooth and feathered Salukis. Their smooths include two champions, Flissa and Firand. Hello, hello. Come here, you. All right. And this is his sister, Flissa, who may or may not cooperate. She's also a champion. Firanu's other child. How are you looking? Huh? Come on. Come on. Life with the Smooths is described by Brian Duggan in his essay, Smooth Going. Smooth Salukis, like single malt whiskey, oysters, foreign films, are an acquired taste. Not everyone gets past the first impression of a job not completed or perceived lack of elegance. I do not remember exactly when I first saw a Saluki, but I do remember thinking that feathers looked very nice and beautiful, but smooths looked somewhat unfinished. Now mind you, this comes from a man who when I saw my very first Saluki, I thought they looked distinctly effeminate. Not a man's type of dog at all. My opinion on both counts has changed, although I will say in my own defense that I came from many years of owning Irish wolfhounds, and it's hard to get more manly than that. And hence, the viewer may well understand my bias against my first impression of a smooth Saluki. When my wife first selected a smooth to sire one of our litters, I was dismayed, but nonetheless respected her knowledge of our lines and grudgingly acknowledged that she knew best. She explained to me about the genotypes of the smooth and the feathered, and made it clear that each puppy in this litter would have a 50-50 chance of being smooth, but overall we could expect about half the litter might be smooths. We would keep one feathered and one smooth from Chabelli's litter, she announced. Further dismay. Smooths were all right for some people, but I didn't especially want one in my house. But if that was what she wanted, I guess it would be all right. You can't argue about these things. After all, I did get used to the bedspread that she bought. Besides, the odds were even that we might not get any smooths. That cheered me up enormously. I then decided that further information was required. On the purest whim, I looked up the word smooth in Webster's New Collegiate Dictionary. Here's what it says. Smooth, having a continuous even surface, being without hair, glabrous, causing no resistance to sliding, free from obstructions or impediments, even and uninterrupted in flow or flight plausibly flattering, ingratiating, serene, equitable, amiable, courteous, sharp, not, excuse me, not sharp, not acid, bland, easy, level, suave, smooth, smoothly, smoothness. Well, that didn't sound too bad. But then again, there was 
smooth hound, a dogfish as mustelous mustelous of southern European waters, lacking a spine in front of the dorsal fin. Well, now that wasn't any help at all. However alien smooths were to me, I was pretty sure they didn't have fins. But I was glad to know that they wouldn't have spines on any dorsal fins that they might happen to have. Ever the optimist, I continued to use my mental powers to persuade Chabelli not to have any smooths, and my wife not to keep them if Chabelli had them. The puppies were born. At birth, you can't tell who was smooth and who was not. When the pups were three weeks old, we made an educated guess that one male and one female of the five were smooths. A distinct sleekness of coat and lack of wavy texture on the ears were the only clues at this point, but by five weeks, the development of the wavy feathering on the other three puppies left no doubt that we were right in our guess. The puppies were all as well-formed and as bouncy as you could hope for, and there was certainly no difference in temperament among them. Hmm. I would have to keep an eye on these smooths. As we watched the puppies grow and begin to evaluate them critically, it became increasingly evident that the two smooths were the best of the litter. My wife now began to talk about keeping both of them. I resigned myself to the inevitable with the feeblest of protests. Well, they were at least as smart, if not smarter, than the rest of the puppies. They were active and inquisitive and definitely affectionate. So the smooth litter mates stayed with us and became part of our pack. They were decidedly smart and charming, and in spite of determined resistance, they soon wormed their way into my affections. I can report to you that I have been able to objectively observe and record the differences between smooth and feathered salukis at close range for five years now. For viewers who have not had the experience of sharing a home with a smooth, let me present certain characteristics that are unique to smooths. Lack of feathering. The most obvious characteristic of a smooth, the key here is that the minimal grooming of a saluki requires, that a saluki requires, is even more minimal with smooths. There is a distinct advantage for the dog that spends a lot of time in the field, the lazy owner, or both. Food consumption deception. Like the joke about being hungry after eating Chinese food, smooths seem to have a black hole that all food disappears into, and yet they give the impression of being perpetually hungry. Do not trust them in matters of food. Smooths will lie to you about this. You can personally dish out their rations, watch them inhale their own food, and then watch as they polish off everyone else's food that was the least bit slow in consumption. They will then come over to you and tell you they haven't seen food for a week. Do not believe them. They lie. Increased thermotactile tendencies. Smooths will arrange themselves next to, around, or on top of you so as to distribute the maximum square footage of their skin against your body. This skin starts a chemical reaction in the smooth's body that increases their body temperature by 20 degrees Fahrenheit. The more uncomfortable it is for you, the closer they want to be. Smooths will do this to you, regardless of record heat waves, crackling fires in the hearth, or the fact that you have just put on your best evening clothes. Variable body mass and surface area. The head of a smooth resting on your legs at the beginning of your sleep period will logarithmically increase in mass until exactly one hour before your alarm is due to go off. At this point, critical mass is achieved and the lack of circulation, deadened nerves and crushed flesh will painfully wake you up with no chance of moving the dog or getting back to sleep before the alarm goes off. If the smooth does not sleep on top of you, it will then arrange itself on the bed so as to occupy the largest amount of horizontal real estate. This will make it impossible for you to adequately cover yourself with blankets. Your freezing feet and backside will wake you, you guessed it, exactly one hour before your alarm is scheduled to go off. Again, there is no hope of getting back to sleep or shifting the dog. The ability to teleport. Smooths have the ability to move through solid objects not to be confused with levitating, which they also do. When placed on one side of an object, such as a door, fence, or wall, the smooth will miraculously appear on the other side. I have seen a smooth on one side of a four-foot gate, and in the time it took me to blink, the smooth was on the other side. In our house, smooths have mysteriously appeared behind locked doors, fences, cupboards, and bitches in season. Some teleportations are quick and easy. Others require more time and effort. A smooth on top of the covers at bedtime will take the entire night to move through and appear underneath the covers in the morning. 
This is not a learned behavior, as smooths that are raised alone will instinctively know how to teleport. Nothing you can do will prevent this. I have extensive documentation of these phenomena. Other smooth owners corroborate my findings. In fact, smooth owners usually attribute anything and everything to the fact that it's a smooth. If the dog eats too little, it's a smooth. If the dog eats too much, it's a smooth. If the dog is exceptionally cuddly, it's a smooth. If the dog is a little standoffish, it's a smooth. If it sleeps all day, it's a smooth. And if it's a demented living room athlete, it's a smooth. You get the general idea. Anyway, after years of observation and close contact, and sometimes you can't pry them off of you, I have developed a taste for smooths as well as for feathers. The smooth bitch that we kept became a mother herself, and we now have her smooth daughter. She shows every sign of being as sweet, clever, and hellacious as her mother. As I said, smooths like single malt whiskey, oysters and foreign films are an acquired taste. I appreciate single malt whiskey as well as blended scotch and the smooth as well as the feathered saluki. I highly recommend all of these to you as they complement each other nicely. And when you next contemplate a smooth, try one. It's a taste worth acquiring. The third line of smooths in America began with Siddiqui Dinesh, a party-colored smooth bitch bred by Don Whedon in England. She was imported in 1971 by Dr. Joanne Van Arsdale of the Chubasco Kennels in Castroville, California, and bred to Jen Araby Karam Bay. Van Arsdale's breeding plan was to produce, as she terms it, plain wrapped Jen Araby dogs. She describes what she looks for in judging smooths. We call these ear lashes. I call these ear lashes. And these, um, a lot of them have them when they're young. And as they grow older, they get sparser and sparser and sparser. I prefer them without them, but they do have a tendency just to go away. His, his pelvic girdle is better than the black. You know what I mean? His pelvic girdle? What do you mean? When I'm talking about the pelvic girdle. Show me what that is. This. Oh, okay. This is the pelvic girdle. It's from the ischium to the ilium. Huh? And it should, it should not be a box like this. It should widen out a little bit. So his is better. He's got more power back there mm -hmm. than the black puppy. Mm -hmm. And his is the best. Nice tail set too. Mm -hmm. Also has a nice long tail. Mm -hmm. Now this dog. Uh, this is, oh, this is something you need to know about smooth. If you're going to talk about smooth, the leather on the ear is extremely important, and the way that the ear is formed and the set, of course, you want a big, wide base on the leather. Mm -hmm. Big, wide, heart-shaped face. None of this rosing back stuff like this. That's bad. Nice, big, long leather with nice, wide base. And then a beautiful, round taper. See, that's hard to breed smooth because you get to see it all. Lots and lots of feathered dogs don't have much leather under their feathering. But you would or never know it. Their ears will go like this, and nobody knows. That's right, you can't see it. Yeah, it's another breed, but nobody knows. This dog is a great moving dog. He can really do it. Here. The first thing is, this dog, this dog is too long in the loin for me. This, this is correct, as far as I'm concerned. This is a correct loin. Okay. This dog, this dog's shoulder, although it looks nice and smooth here, when you stand on it and you start looking down, this is, this is the point of his shoulder. Now here's the spine of the scapula, which gives you the idea that he's got layback. But his blade is coming down like this. This is deceiving. This dog, this is 
spine of his, the point of his shoulder is here, and his whole blade is laid in like this. And here's the spine of his scapula, but you can feel the whole shoulder blade, and it's like this. This dog's head and neck flow down into this part of him, right where they need to be, right at where the muscles should be attaching to the scapula to give him the most power as he drives forward. As the neck comes down and the double suspension develops, this is the power machine right here. A lot of people think the power machine is back here. It's up here. And they need power here, especially if they're going to run and then reach to kill. And this dog will never have the power off the forehand that that dog has. If he can't get that forehand going and driving up, Talk to people who ride horses. The power is it. Jumping horses, they consider the power up here, not back here. This dog will not have the power off the ground that that dog will have. This dog is a little, it's his grip is acceptable, but it's a little flat. It's a little flat. I like this group. I love the drop in this dog's group and the tail set. I love this angle here. And, and he's got arch up in here, and he is this piece, this wide, through the loin, right here. And he's not fat. He's not fat at all. This dog has incredible second thigh, right in here. Very, very strong second thigh, and he is not over-angulated. He's got dog, lovely low hocks. Hmm? Low hocks. He's got low hocks. <laughs> this dog has, he looks big and strong, but he does not have second thigh. It's good, but it's not as good as this dog. And this dog, right here, they're not quite exactly right. They're a little bit, see this? Mm -hmm. That's natural. This dog's standing natural and he drops right down the way he should. It's the Atlanta occipital joint right here. This is the joint between the skull and the, and the neck. And this bone, they call this the axis. This bone, see how wide and strong it is on this dog? Mm -hmm. You can see this? And he's got this crest right here. This dog's head can do anything. When he's working and running, he has power in this joint. Big power. And his neck is set on just right. I, I love the neck set on this dog. The way it goes in here. This dog... Do you want has a neck like a swan. This, this is much more narrow, not nearly so powerful, right in here. And I can make him so crested. I can make him crested, but it's not natural. His natural neck is just it's long enough, but it's not, it's not right. It does not, it comes in two shoulders too high and too straight. See the plumb, the plumb line on this dog? And then, and then that makes his neck go boink, you know, And see now the plumb line on this dog, he doesn't have a plumb line. It goes like this. And this is better. Now you come in here and I'll show you this. this. See this? Mm -hmm. See how wide? This, this bone, when you take this bone out of a live animal, a dead animal, I wouldn't want to take it out of a live animal, <laughs> take it out of a dead animal, it has wings on it, yeah. wings like this. Well, what are you supposed Hindu. to attach it to those? Hindu. A muscle. Yeah. So he's got power up here. I mean, he's got a lot of power. And it swivels. And it works. And when he reaches over to take a rabbit on the fly and yeah. it goes down, He's got the power to get that job done very, very efficiently. The other thing I love about this dog is the back skull. See, my, when I do them, I want my hand to kind of fit on them. Mm -hmm. And I love this, this part of the back skull. That's important to me. To me as a breeder, I want this beautiful back skull right here. This, this, see the difference? Mm -hmm. He hasn't got it. He's, his, he's, every dog has it, 
But he hasn't got what that dog's got. He hasn't got the power for the muscle to attach. And when this dog wants to take game and reach, it's going to be harder for him because he's not got hard, a lot of muscle attachment so he can really get down it. Unless you've watched them hunt and kill, it's hard to understand. His back skull is pretty good. I'm all right with his back skull. That's okay with me. It's this part of this dog, this part of this dog, this long, 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 long stuff that, that bothers me, and this. Wayne Jensen of Janarabi Kennels talks about smooths. Well, uh, and all the pictures, you see during, during World War II, I did, I, I, when I was going all over, I would try to get into libraries and pick up everything I could on Arabian books. Anything that, the first thing I would ask the librarian was, where is your section that you have something on Arabia? And the pictures I've seen, to tell the truth, were all smooth. And so, in their running, in their running and everything, because they are, uh, I think, a faster Saluki. I think that they're, even with their uh, thinness of coat and hide, I think that they're extraordinarily tough and, and have great agility. They're less flaky in their, in their mental process. Probably this is due to the fact that they wasn't glamorized and fussed over or something like this. And probably also because the Europeans and the Americans could not move a smooth saluki. So they didn't, didn't bother to raise them. But I would consider the smooth saluki in comparison with the feathered a, a better saluki. How do you feel about breeding smooth to feathers? Good. I feel very strong about this. I think this is the proper. I think it's the proper way to go. I think you will get better, better offspring both ways. I think I will also think, and I think you get better temperaments. I think it is. It's uh, anyway at our place it has. We've got wonderful temperaments, and oh, our old Teddy dog that's the sire of of uh, Joanne Smooth and Mike Conti and those and the. Uh, uh, he's related. He's related to the dogs that uh, that Abra had bred and all that stuff. Has brought out a beautiful temperament, and that the that the feathers have more of a time that they can flip out on you real easy without. Say you miss being around them a week or attention a week, they will then then kind of kind of look at you sideways. And uh, but the smooth seem like they kind of just hang in there and remember. Uh, do you think that we've lost any basic features in smooth? Lost any? Any features? Uh, do you think the smooths are improved to where the ones you're seeing today are better than the first ones you've seen? You think? I think that they, uh, the ones that I've seen from the old pictures and the ones I've seen earlier, uh, that ours now are getting a little more uh, American show dog look, a little more. Uh, I'm going to say exception to Joanne's. Hers looks to me like a lot of the pictures of the, of the old days that I, uh, that I ran across, and that's some that I have, uh, and some that are on the stamps. That tall squareness, and that bony but hard, lean, chiseled, muscling. I think, as looking at hers the other night, I thought they were truly beautiful. Yes, 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 a higher tariff hill. And at some time, this is one of the reasons that I didn't want to go into them at first was that I didn't like the tail coming up over the back and it was a shorter one. But through their breeding with uh, some of the feathered ones here, they have gotten a little better sweep in their tail, a little more length. I don't think that we have lost uh, any of the features. I think, in fact, uh, they're much more appealing to look at, and they still can do what they're supposed to. Joanne's proving this. She's going out against seasoned veterans in, in, in uh, open field coursing and in competing in the in the top three drawers. Think. What do you see for the future in smooths, and what would you most wish that would happen? I think I think a lot of a lot of people will want to get into smooth. 
and I think they're going to see, just like we're seeing feathered dogs here today, the vast improvement from the old days and more beautiful and and such a wide variety of shapes and colors and sizes which makes it so exciting to look at them that you're going to see this in smooth. You're going to see some awfully good smooth coming around. From Florence Amherst's translation of Abu Nilas, Court Poet and Jester, 800 AD, it is as though behind the place where his eyelashes meet, there are burning coals constantly kindled. Like a hawk swooping on sand grouse, he peels the skin of the earth with four feet. He runs so swift, they do not touch the earth as he runs. In his eagerness, his feet have scratched his armpits, and putting and pulling his arms to his sides, have cut his ears. In his eagerness, the dust is cut from around him. Today, breeders who are interested in preserving the original character of the Saluki have focused their attention on the smooths. They are working to restore and renew our appreciation for the ancient Nejdi, the smooth-coated Saluki from the heart of Arabia.